Welcome to season seven of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. This season, I speak to people in Mexico, America, Ireland, Sri Lanka, India, and the UK. I have stories that I'm sure will resonate with anyone anywhere in the world. For example, how to be more confident, or how are we seen differently in the country of our birth, only because we don't look like everyone else. I also hear stories that are chilling, and I'm moved at how the speaker found the inner resilience to overcome their challenges. I hear stories of music, religion, and so much more. I hope you take away as much as I have when hearing these stories. Thank you so much for listening. Christos Dimitriou is an entrepreneur, music producer, songwriter, and pastor. Chris's commercial history embraces multiple areas of business activity, sports promotion, public relations, a TV broadcast network, and a brokerage business. If that's not enough, Chris is also the author of four books and has hosted a program which is aired in 36 countries and it's called All, It's All Greek to Me. Chris is responsible for three top five chart hits and two number one songs. One of Chris's compositions featured in the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympic Games and appears in Q Magazine's Top 100 Singles of All Time. The Guinness Book of Records cited the original version as being the first sample ever used in a music production. Having worked in different capacities with very many well-known celebrities, Chris is professionally linked to world-renowned music artists. For example, Cat Stevens, David Bowie, Mike Darbo, and John Congos. Yet, let's continue. There's still more to the story. In 1990, Chris and his wife, Lorraine, founded Cornerstone Ministries. It's a registered charity and an evangelical Christian church based in Surrey. Cornerstone Ministry started as a small Bible study group that grew rapidly to a congregation now exceeding 600 people. Cornerstone is a multicultural and multi-ethnic community made up of 41 nations. Welcome, Chris. With your hugely varied life experience, I'm sure you'll have some great stories to share today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure, and I've been looking forward to it. I, I love to talk and encourage people, and uh, I trust that uh, our com discussions today will encourage those, the listeners that you have. Oh, I hope so too, because that's the beauty of, of this con these conversations we have, Chris, because the idea of, of podcasts and unconscious bias is that it's heard all over the world, and I'm sure your stories will resonate with, with you know, people who may not have your experiences, but there's still something else that, that kind of links with them and resonates with them. But before we even go into stories, Chris, you know, we're talking unconscious bias. What do you understand by that? Well, it's uh, how you respond, uh, you know, through everyday life to certain situations or certain people. And it's uh, almost instinctive because it's unconscious. It's just the way you're wired. Um, and of course, all of us, uh, on that conscious of our unconscious biases because it's not something you think about it's just something that happens exactly and it's instinctive and, and it's yes. so therefore how can we be conscious of it i wonder yeah. what, in that regard chris if you could possibly share share a story with me about what that looks like for you or for your stories well i i think my stories uh, my if i think about unconscious bias uh, i mean there's two levels there's there's the the, the natural uh, physical level you know where you, you you know you're consciously engaging but then there's also a spiritual level so i'd like to deal with the two separately sure. on a on, on a natural level um i tend to have subconscious bias towards people and situations that may be influential um and i love uh, to be in a position or to be part of something uh, that influences in a positive way, not a negative way, uh, those around me. Um, so uh, what I tend to do is uh, when uh, certain people or certain situations arise in my life that I know can impact, 
I just get drawn to it and I get drawn into it uh, and I love doing it. Um, and I think all the, the key people in my life that uh, have influenced me is because I was drawn to them. Um, you know, and this is the beauty of, of subconscious uh, uh, matters: is that that um, you, they happen not because you, you know, deliberately and willfully done it, but you can't help yourself being drawn to that. And uh, if you are drawn to positive things, then of course, positive things will arise in your life. Um, I was drawn to uh, a, a person called Tony DeFries, who was at the time David Bowie's manager. And um, that one you know, experience, that, that one encounter, really changed the course of my life. Um, and there were, there were other milestones in my life, and I can always put it down to being drawn to a person and that but, person, you know, sorry, I'm yeah. just curious, but how, so, so can we go back yet again? I mean, because I love the idea, because we all have what we call instincts, don't we? And if I yes. just, uh, let's create a scenario, I'm in a social occasion, and, and most of the people there, um, I don't know, you know, pre-COVID days, when you could actually be at, a, at, a, at somebody's home, when there are 15 or 20 people, and we're mingling and standing around having glasses of wine, but I... And I don't know most of them other than my host. And I have an instinctive affinity with one person more than another. But then what's your story that one that made you? I mean, you know, I'm just curious about why is it that you're drawn to people in this instinctive, unusual way, like David Bowie's manager, for example? Um, it, it, I think it started off with a sincere desire to be successful and then you know, it, it, it's that's very sort of animalistic, if you like. It's not, you just want to be successful, so you want to hang around with successful people. But I think as I've matured in life, I've realized that it, there's something deeper than that. It's wanting to be like them, not just wanting to be successful. That You see something in someone that, um, uh, because it has influence and uh, it, it's not just about success it's about that influence and you would love to have that you would love to to learn by it and and uh, and use it correctly so I've over the years um, obviously instinctively done those things but I've realized that now I'm in a position where I can be influential and people are drawn to me and, uh, and when we get to the spiritual side, it's quite interesting because it, it's both spiritual and natural, this law that we're talking about, this law <laughs> of affinity. <laughs> the law of affinity. Okay, so to come back, because I, because I rudely interrupted you earlier, just to ask yes. about, you know, what was taking you there, but to come back to your story, please continue about, about um, I think you were saying you had met David Bowie's manager, and then what? what yes, I mean, the, the story is I was um, playing in a band, um, and there were five of us, and we were driving up and down the motorway, and everyone thought we'd be very successful. We were even the support act for Led Zeppelin's first gig at Leeds University. Uh, and we were, you know, I think we were okay, uh, and we could have made it. But I was getting more and more frustrated, so I answered an ad in the trade magazine, which was called The Melody Maker, and there was an ad for a production assistant from someone called Lawrence Myers, who was the accountant to all the stars. Anyway, I answered the ad, met Lawrence, and then he introduced me to Dave, David Bowie's manager, to Tony DeFries, and I didn't know Tony, I didn't know, but there was an immediate connection and um, I was drawn to him and I think that opened up something for him because he didn't know much about me and he wasn't looking for a production assistant, he was just looking for someone that uh, he could mentor uh, that would help him uh, going forward. So. Um, 
it just started to unravel from there. That changed the course of my life because I started to work, you know, in the studio. I always wanted to be a record producer. I was learning how to do business. Um, in fact, I instigated uh, the the publishing contract the, that uh, we eventually negotiated and sealed between David Bowie and Chrysalis Music. And uh, I got very friendly with Bob Grace, who at the time was the publishing head. And, um, and, and that changed the course of my life. So I wasn't then playing in a band. Suddenly I was in the music industry as a negotiator, as an executive. Um, learning all the time from Tony um, and then again I met someone else uh, who as well was very influential but in a different area and that directed me to um, being sort of full-time as a record producer so I put these sort of instinctive relationships if you like down to how I was wired up, what was in me, the uh, sincere desire to connect with people and uh, and to be become influential with them, through them, and then eventually on my own. And uh, there's nothing better than influencing people in a positive way. And I think that's really the message that uh, I would like if someone <laughs> said, you know, what's your life story? Uh, I would say, well, I wouldn't have one unless I could influence people in a positive way. But and then help, let's, sorry, yeah, go ahead. And, and, and help them. Uh, and, and that's my heart, especially for younger people, you know, because I think they've been given a raw deal at the moment. Um, at the moment, yes, they have. But I'm just uh, thinking about you as a young person, Chris. Let's go back a few years. Um, certainly by your name, we know that you're Greek and the fact that, that you hosted a television program called It's All Greek to Me. I must ask you about that in a minute. But, but let's just go back to your earlier years as a child. Um, I, because I'm just trying to explore this idea of unconscious bias with you. And the idea that, you know, you, you, you who you are, your number one life story is about influencing other people in a positive way. That's for you, that is what drives you on a day-to-day -day basis. But then let's go back to the beginning, you know, at whatever early age you can think of, it's up to you, five, eight, ten. Um, what were your stories then that may have, and I could be wrong, already uh, uh, started embedding uh, within you that this is a good thing to do? Okay, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned it's all Greek to me. Um, and uh, I was born in a little village in Cyprus, and uh, my parents immigrated to South Africa because, uh, you know, it was the time, you know, the village empty because one person went over and the word got back that it's the land of milk and honey and everything's great over here. So uh, of the five or six hundred people in the village, uh, the majority of them ended up in South Africa. Uh, I was very young. You know, only two years old in South Africa, and um, that uh, you know that started me off, um, you know, learning English and Afrikaans. But I never actually, and I spoke Greek at home. And uh, what happened was my mother wanted me to read and write Greek. So she brought a woman around every Friday afternoon to teach my sister and myself Greek. I hated it. I didn't, I mean, what all my friends were playing and here I was having to learn Greek. And, um, and so uh, it's something that I didn't want to do. But yet, if we fast forward uh, to when I, you know, became a pastor and uh, I started to, um, you know, do sermons and, and, uh, and, and speak uh, before people and, you know, I've done over 6,000 sermons in my life. Uh, the, the key ingredient to how I deliver the message is my understanding 
of the original Greek. So if I wasn't taught to read Greek by this woman, Vespini Zaka, I would never have fulfilled my call. And I mean, I kicked out of it and it was, it lay dormant for 30 years. But now it's the essence, the, 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 the key to how I teach and deliver and, you know, give people insight into the Word of God. Uh, hence, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> I love uh, that story. It's a great story. I mean, because I can tell you, I'm nodding too. I remember uh, being having every Saturday being forced to learn my mother tongue, which is very different to the language. Uh, you know, I grew up in India, as you know, and, and oh, I don't want to do it. But the, the sense of identity and acknowledgement and so on is huge with the benefit of hindsight. So I am laughing because I'm there are many like you who've been in that same experience. But in addition to that, though, Chris, so so you are in South Africa, you know, you, you're You've already, perhaps you wouldn't have been aware of this because you were very little when you moved from Cyprus to South Africa, but you were already a sing, you know, already emigrated from one country to another. Um, so the reason why I'm, I'm continuing that story of your early years is this idea of unconscious bias and going back to your original point about wanting to, 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 to help out and connect with other people. So growing up in South Africa, what was that about? I mean, how did that feel? What kind of lessons do you think with the benefit of hindsight you took away? Um, look, I was very sensitive to my environment, you know, unlike a lot of people. And because I was musical, um, I, for me, there was no apartheid, there was no division. Uh, you know, for me, everyone, you know, was the same. Uh, and, and that didn't help me in that, you know, I got quite frustrated. And also, I, alongside that was that, and you will identify with this, in your community, in our, my Greek Cypriot community, there was a strong bond with everyone. Um, and everyone's life was laid out before them. You know, like my father wanted me to be an accountant, a lawyer or a doctor. And here I am, I'm a musician, <laughs> which he was not pleased with because you know, they, they were the lowest of the low in the villages, the musos. And here is his son. He's worked all his life to give to his son what he didn't have. And I didn't want it. So I became um, almost a model rebel in the uh, Greek Cypriot community. Uh, and I was respected and, and, and revered by all the young people that wanted to do what I was doing, but just didn't have the strength to. So I instinctively um, removed myself so that I could freely move away to the things that I love doing, but also to the environment that I wanted to work in. And that wasn't apartheid. So the song that is still very active today, it's called Step On. Um, it uh, was originally, he's going to step on you again. I wrote the lyrics while I was in South Africa, and it's an anti-apartheid song. It, the, the opening lyrics are, hey, Rainmaker, come away from that man. You know he's going to take away your promised land. And you know, what I was doing is relating what happened in North America with the Red Indians, what was happening in South Africa, that you know there was this dominating force that uh, would steal everything. And, um, and that's just captured the imagination of, uh, I don't know how many generations, but it's been going for over 50 years. And it's still a very active song. So uh, South Africa was difficult for me. I, I then just got on a ship at the age of uh, 17 and, you know, to the horror and distraught of my mother <laughs> and family. And I came to London um, and that was it. I was drawn instinctively to the things, the environment that I felt I could live in and be creative in. Uh, without the barriers that were in place between white and black and colored and Asian. 
Um, and, and, and it's strange because South Africa uh, used to pigeonhole everyone. You know, I was the Greek, you know, my friend was the Portuguese. So, so it wasn't just white and black. It, it was almost, you know, your, your, your heritage, who, who you really are that, uh, that they pigeonholed. And that, te that teaches you a lot. Yeah, um, there's a couple of things here that I, I want to just uh, uh, kind of flag up again for, for the sake of the listeners and myself. Certainly two, two things that come to mind. One is how much your values and your identity and who you are was embedded in those early years in South Africa. Uh, one, because of this uh, apartheid and the fact that, you know, you are a, a white skin and therefore you supposedly should not mix with other people who are black and so on. And, and alongside that, this idea of identity that you are Greek and being forced to learn Greek on a, on a Friday or a Saturday or whatever it was. So that's, that's there, that's being embedded. And, and you don't know it, but you know it in your heart and your head that this business of, of, of showing discrimination is not right. And, and so you, you come away to England, to London. But then alongside that, and this is what I'm finding interesting, is that despite the fact that your parents were clearly unhappy and did not want you to go to London, they were not controlling parents. And I'm deliberately saying that because there would be people around the world hearing your story and saying, ah, oh, Chris, you were lucky. You managed to do what you wanted to do. You got to London. You know, you had the confidence to go and speak to, to, to David Bowie's manager and X, Y, Z. Um, so there was also some level of genuine support from the parents, despite the fact that your father must have said, oh my God, my son's let me down, he's not going to be an accountant. Or am, um, I, am I going around the wrong path on that one? No, well, I, I, you know, my mother was always supportive. I mean, she was an incredible support for me and, uh, you know, but my dad, I had to fight him every step of the way. So, um, you know, if, it, if you really want it, uh, you know, the first obstacle you may have to overcome is resistance from your parents and, of course, then your immediate community. If, exactly. If um, and that's why, uh, you know, my dad was okay with me playing an instrument when I was nine, but then when I joined the band at the age of 12, he objected because he knew that that would take me somewhere else. And, uh, you know, I fought him. Uh, you know, he, he, he used to hide my guitar. Uh, and then I was, he found out I was still playing in the band. And, and then he broke the guitar. Uh, and that's how I learned to play the, the piano, because there was a piano in the house. And my sister was having lessons on it. Well, now I couldn't play guitar, so I just learned to play the piano. I taught myself, but I fought him right up until I had my first hit in South Africa, and I was 16. Um, so for for about four years, the, there was all-out war. Then I took the 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 record, and I showed his name, me and Dimitriou, on the, the sleeve, and I said, "Look, Dad, this is what my music has achieved." And then he just turned around and, and then he started to support me. That's um, wonderful. I mean, because it says it so, says so much about you, Chris, and your genuine passion and self-belief, because that's what I want the listeners to take away. That, you know, we really, really, really want to do something. Uh, you've got to keep at it. You've got to keep at it. Don't give up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, I got that from him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. I love it. But yes, do, do share another story, Chris. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'd like to sort of move to the spiritual Please, side. Please, I'd love that, yeah. So, so you know, I, here I am. I've done all the things I wanted to do, achieved almost all my goals. I had the success, and um, but I was still empty uh, inside. And I remember. Oh, pause a minute. What does empty inside mean? I want. I want uh, us I, to understand that. Yes, uh, it's being frustrated because you know there's more. There's something else. And I remember when I was working with Cat Stevens, uh, 
and he uh, he found Islam, and he he tried to convert me to Islam, and 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 then he said, Chris, you're still searching. And, and until you find it, you're, you're not going to be settled. And I agree with him. Um, but he couldn't persuade me to leave my, leave my old life and take on this new life. So I had to have an encounter with God that was personal and real, which I did have, and that's what turned me around. Um, and then, uh, I, because I was drawn to that first thing. So I'm a 1,000% kind of person. I can't just dip my toe in it. I'm, I dive in. So when uh, I found God and, and you know, I, I pursued, uh, you know, the, the Christian faith, um, I just dived in. I, I shut down everything, went back to South Africa because that's where I, I, I I was visiting my parents, and that's where I had this God encounter. And I just stayed there, and I met my wife, and worked in the church, and just things totally changed. Can I but, ask the encounter? Is that too much to ask? Would you share? Um, yes. I, I, you know, I was... My sister used to, to pray for me a lot, and then, you know, she'd call me, and I would sort of giggle, you know, over the phone because I thought, what are they doing? These are really strange, weird people saying that, oh, God told me to do this and we're praying for you. You know, that was just not in my vocabulary. And uh, anyway, I hadn't seen my parents for a long time. So I went uh, to South Africa and then my sister said, well, will you come to church with us? And I thought, oh, no. Um, so I... You know, How old were you, Chris, at this point? Uh, in my 30s. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, this is having done all those things. And, you know, when I worked with people like Cat Stevens, I mean, we used to write and produce songs for everyone. We had on Buddha in the chocolate box. We had Buddha, we had Islam, we had Jesus, we had everyone. So, you know, we were open to everything, but we, it wasn't real. And this is the thing. So anyway, I, out of embarrassment, I went to church. Uh, and I'm sitting there, and because the minister is saying the things he's saying, I'm convinced that I've been set up. Um, because how would he know? It's, you know, it's like he's reading my, my mail. And I thought, well, my sister's told him about me. And at the time, I was a, a compulsive gambler, so I could work What was he saying? We have to ask. The listeners will say, Chris, tell us more. What was the minister saying? Well, I don't, I don't, re well, I don't really remember the detail of it, but it was but obvious. Even something, yeah. yeah but speaking to my heart about things, you know, about forgiveness and fear and all those things that, mm. and that you know, I was riddled with. Um, and uh, he, he, at the end of his, his message, he, he just said, well, you know, if, if God's spoken to you today, you know, if, if God's touched you, then I'd, I'd like you to come forward so I can pray with you. Well, of course, I, I, I'd worked out the odds of this happening, uh, being, you know, my sister briefing him and setting me up. But when he said that, something happened, something touched me, and I started to weep like a baby. Um, and I, I found myself kind of going forward. And I thought, wow, Chris, you've been living on the edge for so long and maybe you've just flipped. <laughs> so I'd worked it all out in my mind that this wasn't real. But the moment he prayed for me, a peace that surpasses understanding came into my mind and into my heart. And it's a peace that I've been seeking all my life, you know, because you're you're afraid of winning, you're afraid of losing, you're afraid of you know all this fear and anxiety that was inside me, you know, and just sort of swirling around for years. It just left, and this peace. And then I said to myself, well, if this is insanity, hey, this is quite cool. This is cool. <laughs> I love it.
That's so yeah. moving though, Chris. I mean, I'm laughing, but it's not a laugh. That is very, very moving because it's 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 about some of it is about being in the right place at the right time. There you you were in South Africa. You did not want to be uh, in the church, but you went just to please your sister. Yes. But that, clearly, prior to that, you had already been questioning. You're in your thirties. You're you're an adult. You know, it's you're not like twelve or fifteen, uh, and yeah. you've been questioning. And you already, because you have the the privilege of ha- being close to Cat Stevens, you've already had this conversation about spirituality, about what this means to us. Cat Stevens has tried to communicate with you and suggest maybe the the path of Islam would be the right thing for you. So yeah. there've been there've been these questions going on in your head. For a few years prior to being where you are. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, I was seeking, um, but uh, I, I believe all of us take a different journey to find God. Um, you know, the, the, the journey that you would take or Yusuf had taken is different to my journey. But uh, uh, the person leading us, you know. In the, to, to that place is God Himself by His Spirit. So, you know, although I was resistant, I didn't understand it. I know that that was a God encounter because He had orchestrated it. He knew that I was an odd person, and that if I was going to encounter Him, He'd have to give me odds that I could not fathom. Um, because otherwise I would always question it. I know without shadow of doubt that what happened to me that day could never have been orchestrated by anyone other than my creator. And that changed my life, that turned me around. And even the way I met my wife, because she traveled from Scotland and I traveled from London uh, and I went to this little swimming baths you know, pool um, up the road from where I was raised um, and it, there was only a you know, small patch of green grass there but it was full of people. I happened to sit next to my wife and um, her empty cup blew over and I gave it to her and she was with her mother and I picked up the Scottish accent I said, oh you're from the UK, so am I. That is how I met my wife. What are the odds <laughs> of people traveling that and meeting in a public place? And that, and not only that, I was reading a book that she'd read. Um, yeah, it's just unbelievable. So I love it. It was how, planned. It was ordained. Yes, it was so ordained. You go back there. You go to that church. You sit in that tiny little grass patch. Yes, I love it. I love it. And because, you know, we often, it's serendipity, but it's also not serendipity. That's what you're saying. And and this is why, you know, those listening to us today um, need to be encouraged because, you know, we can't do all the seeking, all the sweat and toil trying to find things. In fact, on Sunday, my message was, uh, (laughs) I can't find what I'm looking for. Remember, there was a song by Bono, uh, YouTube, you, you two that um, that uh, has that lyric, and I, I taught about how do you find what you're looking for. You realize that God has to take you to a place, and and He, he has to do certain things for you to really find the, the uh, them, and and um, that's what happened to me. I, it, he orchestrated it in such a way that I couldn't help but end up where I am today. And uh, so if you're looking and you haven't found it, uh, don't worry, it will come to be. So so where so. are you today, Chris? You've got a congregation of 600 people. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you're, you're, you're supporting, mentoring young people um, yeah. and you continue with the music. Yes. And even your, even your, even your sermons are, are musically connected, which is lovely. Yes. Well, I um, the the desire to to influence people in a positive way and and help them, um, the the tools that God gave me was a my understanding of the Greek, so I can read the original Greek, not the translation, because you can't translate Greek 
to or to English directly. I mean, one word can take a whole paragraph to explain. So it's a very, you know, that's why the term, it's all Greek to me comes from, it's because Greek is so um, descriptive and so accurate that you can take one word and uh, elaborate on it. I mean, you drop it in its setting and it comes alive. So I use that um, to, uh, to show people, to take people to a place where once you unravel this and put it back together again, they say, I can see it. So I love people to see the truths that will help them in their lives. And they're what I call universal truths. It's like the law of, you know, sowing and reaping, uh, the law of gravity. If you jump off a building, it's going to work, whether you believe it or not. The law of sowing and reaping, you, you know, if you sow bad seed, you're going to get bad crop. You, whether you believe it or not, that you can't deny that. Um, but if you sow good, that's what you will get. You will get good. And... Uh, explaining these universal principles and truths to people and unraveling them. The Bible is full of them. So it's a manual for life and, uh, and young people need to, they need help, they need to see things, they need to, uh, you know, uh, have good self-esteem and, you know, self-worth and build themselves up and God's Word does that. But I'm, uh, uh, focused, fully focused on delivering a word that, that encourages and builds up and influences in a possible way. So that's what I do every Sunday. I love it. Um, I, I, you know, I can't wait for the next Sunday. And the way I, I do my sermons is the same way I used to write songs. You know, writing songs, I, I would always be the instigator uh, of whatever my songwriting partner and I wrote because I would have that initial lyric. And how I would have that is I'd, my antenna would be up all the time. And if someone said something or if I saw something, I would just write it down. Well, But that's, that's about giving, supporting others though. How about you yourself? How do you manage your own uh, demons and unconscious biases? We all have those. That's life, right? So do you, okay. do, you do something for yourself or is it... Is oh, it you're supporting oh, yeah. others that helps you? Oh, that, that's where you get, you know, that's where you get your energy. But uh, you've got to get inspiration. And inspiration is always supernatural. Uh, it kind of doesn't come from just looking at a sunset going down, although that's beautiful. Real inspiration comes from the Holy Spirit. And I spend time in God's Word and in meditation. But... I, I'm also very, very disciplined in my thought life. So how I operate is I only have one compartment open at any one time. That's so hard. Now, yes, but you've got to discipline yourself because you can't be, you know, talking to you and having your mind somewhere else. Or That's fair, yeah. Um, so I... When I'm, you know, at church, when I'm like, today I'm, I'm off to the church office, I, I don't have, my mind isn't on my work, it's not on, you know, the football game that I'm going to watch, or it, it's purely disciplined and focused on that one thing. Now, life isn't an exact science, so there are times where suddenly there are five doors open, and... You know, then you have to rapidly shut the ones that aren't priority um, so that you can focus and, and put your energy into that one. If I couldn't do that, I would burn out. So one thing at a time. When I One thing at a time. <laughs> we will always have five doors, 10 doors, 20 doors open. Yeah. Focus you, on what we need to do now and just do that. Good advice. Yes, just Good learn. Advice. Learn to shut them, and if you're at home uh, and you know you're with your family, it's family time. Don't have the phones on, and don't you know? Obviously, if someone is hemorrhaging in the street and you've got to go and help them, that's different. But 
you know, taking, doing things that are not that important aren't going to benefit you. You, I, I have a, a sort of um, measure that I use, uh, you know, is it important? Yes. Uh, can I deal with it? Yes. Can I deal with it now? That's the big one. <laughs> so, you know, when you get to, because sometimes, you, you know, your priorities, you're, you're forced to deal with a priority that's maybe 10 or 12 in your list because of other people's needs. And you've got to resist the temptation and be, be able to say no for your own sake in a nice way. I mean, you know, you don't ever reject someone that's truly in need. But you can be drawn into stuff that uh, it just wastes your time and wastes other people's time. But if you go through your checklist and say, well, and you get to, well, can I do it now? You know, if it's yes, 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 yes. And then it's like two in the morning. Well, the chances are you're going to say no. Well, then you just go to sleep. Yeah. Good advice. I could keep talking, Chris, but I think this is a good time to stop. Well, Chris you. Dimitriou, uh -huh. thank you so very much for your sharing your stories of unconscious bias with me today. I think the listeners will take a lot away from it. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure and I've really enjoyed it. And yeah, maybe we will do it again sometime. Exactly right. Thank you again. Proud to announce that my podcast series is now heard in 104 countries, ranging from Guadalupe to Iceland, Argentina to Palestine, and even Morocco. It is ranked in the top 3% worldwide. This is clearly a series that connects with people all over the world, and you are one of them. I thank you for listening. I would also like to thank Jack Godfrey for his original music in the closing of each podcast interview. If you like this episode, please do share, rate, and review. I am Smitha Tharoor. Until next time.